Hi, this is Nick Freitas, and welcome back to Making the Argument. So, May 15th is coming up, and what does May 15th mean to all of us this year? Well, it means it's tax time. You got to fill out your federal income taxes. And of course, based off of the speech that we just heard from Joe Biden, he is adamant about making sure that people pay their fair share. And it's not just Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We hear this all the time about fair share. And so here's what I wanted to do today. I want to go over what does the tax code actually look like within the United States? And then we're going to ask the question, what is a fair share? Who is currently paying taxes? What does it cost us to pay taxes? What are the different taxes that we, that we actually have to pay? And we're going to answer a lot of those questions that, that I know I've received from people. Questions like, what is a fair share? Questions like, um, you know, can we afford more tax cuts? Questions like, do corporations really get away with not paying any taxes despite the fact that they can be incredibly profitable? We're going to answer all those questions today. Okay, and so here's, here's what we're going to start off with. We're going to start off with the very nature of taxation. Right? And the very nature of taxation in this country, if you, if you read the Constitution, and what was the federal government allowed to tax? Because it used to be that the federal government pretty much raised its revenue through things like tariffs or excise taxes, right? So it, it, a tariff is a tax on a foreign good. So if, if I want to buy something that was made in England and they sell it here, well, then I would pay an additional tax on top of what it would actually cost to just pay for that good or service, and the federal government took that money, right? So tariffs were a large portion of the way the federal government um, you know, collected revenue and spent it. Obviously, that's not the primary way the federal government collects money now. So what changed? Well, the first income tax we ever had in this country started during the Civil War, but really the, the modern income tax as we understand it today was started in 1913, right? It was started with the 16th Amendment to the Constitution where the federal government passed an amendment, all right, and the states ratified it, saying that the federal government could now collect a federal income tax. Now, originally, they were gonna put a 3% cap on that federal income tax, but they didn't do that. And one of the reasons why they didn't do that is because there was a lot of legislators, because the way that the, the concept was originally written, it was, it was gonna be a 1% tax, and then in the amendment, they're going to put a 3% cap. And a lot of legislature, legislators were opposed to that because they said, well, my gosh, if you're only going to charge 1%, but you put in the amendment that the federal government could charge up to 3%, well, then that's what they're going to charge. Now, in hindsight, I think we all wish, I mean, even if they were going to pass the 16th Amendment, which I wish they didn't, but if they're going to pass it, I think now looking in hindsight, most of us wish they would have just put in the 3% cap. Because if you look at the overall tax rates now, it's significantly higher based off of the marginal uh, tax rates that we have. Okay, but that is when the federal government all of a sudden assumed this power to be able to tax income. But is that the only way that we're taxed in this country? Well, clearly it isn't, right? There's three general categories that we're taxed. Some of them are by the federal government, some of them are by state and local government. So what are those three categories, all right? Well, the first way, you, you can define it this way. You are taxed on what you earn, you are taxed on what you buy, and you are taxed on what you own, all right? So what you earn, income, right? The, the most common version of this are things like when you pay um, your federal income taxes or your state income taxes, if you live in a state that has income tax. Uh, capital gains tax, right? Capital gains is a tax you pay on money you've already paid taxes on, but since you reinvested it and made more money off of it, they tax you once again, right? That's capital gains. Those are all taxes on earnings. All right, taxes on what you buy. What's an example of that? Sales taxes. So every time you go in and you, you buy a new car or you buy a piece of property or whatever it is, you generally pay sales tax. Now, again, there's some taxes that, or there's some states that don't have sales taxes, right? But in most states do. So you, you pay a tax for every time you engage in a market transaction. Um, some uh, countries have what they call a value added tax, which is also a form of a sales tax. And then that third category, you're also taxed on what you own. So the most obvious version of this is property taxes. If you own a home or if you own property, you pay taxes for the privilege of owning that property, right? Now, some states have what they also call tangible property. Like a lot of times we associate property tax with like a home, but you also pay property taxes on things like your car. Here in Virginia, they actually charge businesses a tax 
on property they own in order to conduct business. So even if the business doesn't make any money, right, which a lot of businesses for, you know, when they first start up for several years, won't be making a profit, doesn't matter. The government will tax you on the property that you own in order to conduct your business. That's another form of property taxes, right? So there's multiple ways that you are taxed in this country, multiple ways. Now the sales tax, a lot of times people will, will talk about the sales tax or the property taxes as being more regressive. And the reason why is because there's almost no way to get around it, right? There's almost no way to get around it. Chances are, you are you're gonna eat out occasionally, you're gonna you know, buy clothes at the store, you're gonna buy groceries. There's, there's any number of things that you buy that potentially have a sales tax associated with it. <clears throat> and so that's one of the taxes that pretty much all of us pay. Property taxes are another one. Obviously, if you own a home, you're paying property taxes. Now, some people say, well, what about renters? Well, typically property taxes are worked into the rental property as well. So a renter is also, to some degree, also paying property taxes, right? So those are the taxes that pretty much everyone pay. But that begs the question, what about income taxes? Does everybody pay income tax? Because a lot of times when the federal government is talking about people paying their fair share, or when the federal government is talking about raising taxes, they mean income taxes, or they mean something like corporate taxes. And it's important to understand, corporate taxes is just, a, it's another tax on earning. It falls into that broad category. Income tax, capital gain tax, corporate taxes, those are all taxes on what you earn, right? But the federal government typically isn't charging property taxes or sales taxes. They're typically charging income taxes, corporate taxes, capital gains taxes. That's what the federal government is raising revenue. So when they talk about raising taxes or when they talk about paying their fair share, that's generally the category they're talking about. And so this begs the question, who is actually paying those taxes? Because according to Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren, you know, the, the rich are not paying their fair share. Now, you'll notice something. They never really define what rich is. I mean, every once in a while, they'll throw out a number, right? They'll, you know, no one making, no, one, no one's taxes are going to go up if you're making over $250,000 a year. Or no one's taxes are going to go up if you're making over $400,000 a year. They'll say things like that. But they never actually define what is, what is rich, what does wealthy mean? The other thing that they never define is, what is a fair share? And so I think one of the most important things that we can do today on this podcast is give you an argument for the, for the fair share component of this discussion. Because if we don't define fair share, if we don't define our terms, well then fair share is an empty bucket that any politician can use to mean anything they want. And that is what we have commonly seen. And, and the thing that is so intellectually dishonest and disingenuous about this is that has Joe Biden not had a sufficient amount of time to actually think about what a fair share means when he uses that term? I mean, the guy has been in elected office longer than I've been alive. Has he not had an opportunity to, to really think about this? And when he uses that term, then at least have the decency to follow it up with the definition of what he means by it. Because here's the reality, and, and one of the things that you need to understand about this that I, I thought was fascinating. There was a recent article that was put out by uh, Phil Graham and another gentleman who used to be, I think he was the assistant commissioner for uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I believe. And they were talking about the census report because the census department was coming out and talking about wealth income inequality. And what they found is, is when they looked at these numbers, because that wealth income inequality is a lot of what Joe Biden uses to justify his fair share comment. What they found is, is that when the Census Bureau was actually doing this data, which now politicians are using in order to justify tax increases, the Census Bureau deliberately did not mention or did not include two things that are very important. One, they didn't include two thirds of the programs in this country that are actually used to redistribute wealth. They didn't, they didn't factor that in. They just ignored it. The second thing they didn't factor in is your income versus how much you pay in taxes. So let me tell you why these two factors are very, very important, all right? <clears throat> if the argument is, is that the rich aren't paying their fair share, and because the rich aren't paying their fair share, we have huge issues of wealth, income, inequality. Like that, that's one of the, the primary causes. Well, then you would think is that as we're looking at income, we wouldn't just consider what someone is earning. We would also consider what their total wealth is 
based off of the government transfers that they receive. So if somebody makes $20,000 a year, but because of the earned income tax credit or because of different welfare programs or because of different uh, things like a WIC or whatever else it is or, or whatnot, they're actually making you know, thirty dollars to $40,000. Well, then that should be factored in when you look at the overall income that they are receiving. I mean, yes, there's a certain amount of income they're receiving from their own labor, but then there's a lot of other income that they're receiving as a result of wealth redistribution programs. And to not count that into the equation is to deliberately misrepresent and skew the numbers in favor of an end result that you want. Now, why is that also important when we're talking about wealth income inequality? Well, because it turns out that about half the country pays almost nothing in federal income taxes which means their taxes are not being used in order to raise the revenue for the programs that are redistributing wealth. So now what they're doing is they're saying this person made, again, we'll just say $20,000 a year. This person made $150,000 a year. And so there's a, there's a big discrepancy. There's a big difference between how much this person is making at $150,000 versus how much this person is making at $20,000. But if we really wanted to be accurate in comparing it, here's what we'd find out. What we would do is we say, okay, how much is the person making $150,000 or $250,000 or $1.5 million? How much are they paying in taxes? What's their overall tax liability and obligation? Combined with what sort of benefits are they receiving? And when you, when you minus the amount of taxes that someone is paying and you increase the amount of transfer that somebody else is receiving, that gives you a far fairer picture of what it actually looks like on the ground. So what does that look like? Well, let's look at it. Bottom 20%. So bottom 20% means you're making 15,000, a little over $15,000 uh, a year. Okay. When you look at the various transfers and things like that, right, that, that equals up to about $25,000. So you went from $15,000 to $25,000. Okay. Then what are the federal taxes paid on that? About $800. So your after tax income is over $24,000. What if you're in the next 20%? Well, you're making $31,000. Well, after all the transfers, where are you at? Well, after all the transfers and taxes, you're at $43,000. If you're at $53,000, all right, after all the transfers and the taxes you pay, you're at $60,000. If you make 88,000, after all the transfers and taxes, you're at 86,000. If you're making $253,000, after your tax income, you're making 195. If you're making 1.5 million, which is considered the top 1%, after all the federal taxes and transfers, you're making one point, you're making 1 million, uh, 37,000. So what does that equal out to? I know that's a lot of numbers I just threw at you. What does that equal out? Here's what it means. If you're in the bottom 20%, the amount of taxes that you pay versus the, the benefits that you receive means that you pay negative 56% in taxes, right? So you are a net beneficiary. You are paying no taxes. The total number that you get with respect to federal, now again, you're still paying sales tax, you're still paying property taxes and things like that. But with respect to federal taxes, the very taxes that Joe Biden is talking about, you're a net beneficiary. What if, you're in the, what if you're in the next 20%, right? So that's the bottom quintile, right? The bottom 20, the next 20%. That's, uh, you're, you're, you're at negative 39% in taxes. What about the next 20? You're at negative 15% in taxes. You, you have to actually get up to the fourth quintile. So someone making over $88,000 a year before you're paying any taxes. And what it actually, federal taxes. And what it actually equates to is about 3% in overall taxes. If you're making over $250,000 a year, you're paying about 23% in taxes. If you're making 1.5 million, you're paying 34% in taxes. Okay, so here's my question. Maybe you think the rich should pay more. Maybe you think everyone should pay more. Maybe you think certain people should pay less. Whatever, whatever you think, you cannot tell me, you cannot tell me that Somehow, the people that are paying all the taxes, which is roughly the top 50%, the top 50% of, of wage earners in the country are paying roughly 97% of the total taxes, federal taxes, 97%. In fact, in most cases, the only real taxes that the bottom 50% are paying are, are into things like Social Security and Medicaid. And the reason why you have to look at that differently is because now you are paying directly into a program for which you benefit from. 
right? If you didn't pay into that program, it wouldn't exist. So you, you can't really look at that as the same as income taxes, which are taken specifically for the general use of the federal government. So here's my question. How can you look at those numbers? How can you say that roughly the, the people that are currently, and this is another thing to, to remember, right? The people that are in the bottom 20%, they're, not, they're typically not there their entire life. In fact, most people that are in the bottom 20% are, are there because they're younger. It's the same phenomenon that we see with minimum wage. Most people making minimum wage, those are, those are 25 and younger, right? That is, that is not a career you know, path for someone. People start off making less money when they're younger and they make more money as they get job experience and they move up the economic ladder. They buy you know, a house, they start to invest, they do whatever they do. But typically people make more money the older that they get for obvious reasons. So here's, here's my question. How can you look at this and with a straight face say that, well, rich people, again, which you haven't really defined, but rich people are not paying their fair share. Because if you're going to do that, then what I want politicians to do is define what a fair share means. Now, it could be, it could be, and I think that people like Bernie Sanders are actually a little bit more honest about this. Obama was accidentally honest about this when he got caught on tape saying that he wants to spread the wealth around. And when politicians, when politicians were actually confronted with the idea that certain taxes actually lower the overall revenue to the government, all right, so hear that again. The tax policy is so bad that the government actually makes less money on higher taxes. And the response to that was, well, it, it makes for a fairer environment. So let me get this straight. You're not even collecting taxes at this point to pay for legitimate functions of government. You're just collecting taxes to quote unquote, make it fairer. You're, you're going to punish productivity because you think that makes things fairer. But again, people like Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama, others, they've at least been somewhat honest to say that they're not raising these taxes because, you know, they think it's going to generate more revenue or whatnot. They're raising taxes because they believe that someone who's made a certain amount of money shouldn't have access to it. Doesn't matter if they made it through honest, hard work, labor, innovation, doesn't matter. If they have a certain amount, they're going to take it and they're going to redistribute it. Okay, if, if you believe in that, great. Don't call it a fair share, though. Don't, I mean, how dare you call that a fair share? Instead, just say what you really mean. You, you want to give, give more money to certain groups of people, and the only way you can do that is by taking money from other people that have earned it. Okay, I, don't, I don't think there's anything fair about that. But if that's what you want, or if you think that creates a better society, great. Go out and be honest with the public about what you actually want to do and why you think it will actually achieve better results. But don't call it fair. So when we get into this conversation with people on the left that talk about fair share, one of the most important things that you can do is, is before you get into any argument talking about how much the wealthy pay versus how much um, the poor pay, before you get into any of that, any of that, you look at that person, you ask them this question. Can you tell me what you think a fair share is? Just tell me what you think a fair share is. Here's another way to ask the question. And, and Walter Williams, uh, who passed away last year, was a brilliant economist. He used to say that his definition of social justice was he keeps what he earns, you keep what you earn. And if you don't agree with that, explain to him how much of what he earns belongs to you and why. I think that's a great way to, that, that redefines the entire conversation. But if you, if you just simply go into the numbers and crunching figures and looking at statistics and everything else, you're missing the point. Whenever somebody talks about fair share, make them define what a fair share is. Because I'm willing to bet you could ask five different progressives what a fair share is and you can get five different answers. Five different answers. So, what do we usually mean when we talk about fair share? Well, the, the example I like to use, because I think, it's, I, I think it's the easiest to understand, is we usually mean a fair share with respect to, I pay in based off of what I'm getting out of something. So for instance, if I go to dinner with five of my friends, there's a couple different ways we can split the check, right? One way that we could split the check is we can say everybody pays for what they order. That way, if I order something differently than what my friend orders, if, I, if, if he orders a salad and I order prime rib and lobster, well, I'm obviously going to pay a lot more than him, but I'm getting a lot more. And I've made that decision with my own money 
uh, with my own resources and based off of my own preferences. He's made his decision based off of his money and his preferences. Okay, another way that we could split the, the check is we could say, well, we're just gonna split it evenly. Well, now all of a sudden, what have you done? You've created an incentive to order more food because after all, if, if you order something that's less expensive, you're still gonna be on the hook for paying things that you never got a benefit from. So now you've, you've incentivized people to actually order something they might not otherwise would have ordered because they're gonna be on the hook for, for an even portion of the bill regardless of what they actually ordered. All right, what's the third way that we could split the money? Well, you could split the money. You could say, well, we're gonna go out to dinner, the five of us, but we're gonna pay based off of what the individual incomes are of everybody at the table. So, okay, in that scenario, what sort of incentive structure have you created? Well, if, if the person sitting at the, if the wealthiest person sitting at the table, they've got to be careful because now they, they're not just factoring in the price of their meal. They've got to factor in the price of what anybody else at that table could potentially order and, and, and how that could affect the bottom line because they know they're going to be on the hook for, you know, again, in, in a scenario like this, based off of our tax code, they might be on the hook for 20% of your bill, 80% of your bill, 97% of your bill. So what sort of incentive structure have we created? Well, I would say in that situation where you're not paying for what you ordered, you're not even splitting the check evenly among everyone, now you're creating a scenario where I'm on the hook for what other people get regardless of my own preferences. Am I going to go to dinner with those people? No. I, I, you have now disincentivized me going out to dinner with my five friends. Why? Because I never know what I'm going to be on the hook for. So. Again, if we're going to talk about, if we're going to use that term fair, then fair needs to have a, a, a relatively objective meaning. And, and I, would, I would argue that fair as we understand it ha, has usually always meant I pay in accordance with what I receive, or I at least pay in accordance with what I, I choose. I shouldn't have to pay in accordance with what somebody else chooses. But... Again, the, the reason why they talk about fair share is because of, of two things. One, because they refuse to define it, it allows them to constantly move the goalposts. So now they say a fair share is 40% top marginal tax rate. Well, if that generates the revenue they want in order to spend money, well, then they might be happy with that until they want more money. And then what do they do? Do they come back and they say, okay, well, yeah, the tax code's fair, but we still need more revenue, so we're going to raise taxes on everybody. No, they don't do that. They come back with the exact same argument two, three, four, five years later. Well, the tax code's not fair again. Well, wait a second. If fair is a, is a moving target, if there's no objective understanding of what that means, then, then really all you're doing is manipulating people in order to try to convince them that it's okay if you're taking from somebody else because you're going to receive the benefit. I mean, if that's the sort of logic we want to use, well then, okay, robbing a bank is fine, provided that once I take the money from the bank, I give you some, right? Because the bank's not paying their fair share. No, that's not what fair share is. So that's the first thing I want you to do. When you get, in, when you get into this argument with someone on the left about fair shares, it's the first thing you do is ask them what actually constitutes a fair share. Ask them that first. The next thing that you should go into is what do you think taxes should be raised for? Because this is another huge point of contention, right? There's some people that think that the government should run just about everything. There's some people that think the government should run all of healthcare and all of education and should micromanage the economy. You have certain people in Congress right now that want to nationalize major industry. You saw that in, you see that in communist regimes, you see it in fascist regimes where they want the government to essentially micromanage industry and the economy. Well, if, if you're someone that believes in that, if you're someone that believes in a socialist or a fascist approach to economic policy, well, then you're someone that's going to want the government to either confiscate or control wealth on an enormous level. And so before we can even talk about, you know, what appropriate tax rates should be, what we need to first establish is what do you think is an appropriate role for government? And when they collect taxes, what's the purpose? Is the purpose to fund those things that the government is doing? Or, or is there some other purpose behind the taxes that you're raising? So that's the second question you ask, right? What do you think the government should be doing? What do you think the government should be raising taxes for? 
Because once again, you talk to five different people, you're going to get five different answers on this. Once you've established that, if you've actually gotten to the point where someone will tell you, I think a fair share is this, I think this is what the government should be spending money on. The next question that you should ask, and this is the one that starts to require a little bit more study on, on how the current tax code actually exists, is you start to ask people like, okay, well, what is the measure of success? So if we actually taxed for the things that you want us to tax for at the rates you wanted us to tax people at, what's the benefit that we get from that? Explain to me the larger societal benefit we get, because again, it, it, there is a cost to taxation. So is the benefit that we get from raising those taxes higher than the cost we pay for having to pay those taxes. And this is the part where I want to diverge a little bit into the whole cost-benefit analysis of taxation. Because a lot of times you'll see politicians talk about taxes and, and government spending as if it is just a net benefit. Like whenever I hear the government talk about creating jobs or investing, I want to go nuts. Because the government does not invest your money. The government redistributes your money. Investing is something that you do when you assume personal risk. Investing is not something that the government does. The, the, the government spends money on various projects. Sometimes they're legitimate functions of government, sometimes they're not. But here's the overall cost associated with that. And, in, and I'm going to recommend a book to you here that I think is really important. It's called Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. And what Hazlitt pointed out was that whenever you look at spending, it could be private sector spending, it could be government sp sector spending, you can't just look at the scene. Or, or what happens, the spending that took place, or the bridge that was built, or the building that was established, or the park that was created. You can't just look at that. You have to also consider the things that would have been built or created had you not used the money for the purpose that you did. And the reason why this is so important when we look at taxation and government is because government loves to point toward the amount of money they spent in education, or the amount of the money they spent on a, a bridge to nowhere or the amount of money they spend on an infrastructure project. But they never want to actually weigh the cost associated with it. Because it's not as if the decision was between having that bridge or having no bridge. It's not as if the decision was between, or excuse me, having that bridge or having nothing. It's not as if the decision was between having um, this money spent on education or no money spent on education. The real, the real cost that we need to look at is this. For every dollar, the government takes from you. That is a dollar you no longer have to spend on something that you wanted or that you needed. So maybe you would have spent it on something to do with education. Maybe you would have spent it on a new car. Maybe you would have spent it on a, a dinner out. Maybe you would have invested it in a company. Right? Those are, that is the cost. It's not just the money that was taken. It's all the different opportunities. It's all the different job creation. It's all the different economic activity that no longer took place as a result of you spending your money the way you wanted because it's been confiscated by the government. Now the government is spending it based off of what the government wants. And so it's, it's not fair, it's not intellectually honest to just say, well, without us, that bridge wouldn't have been built. Well, maybe it wouldn't have been. But that just begs the question, what are all the things that were not built or not created because you took money out of the hands of the people that earned it? in order to build something that they might not have wanted. Maybe the reason something wasn't created or something wasn't built was because there wasn't enough demand in the private sector for that thing to be built in the first place. And if you're not willing to at least consider that, then you're not serious about the overall costs associated with taxation. Now, that would be bad enough. It would be bad enough to completely ignore the unseen versus the seen. That would be bad enough. But this is how convoluted our tax code has become. To give you an idea, the Bible has about 700,000 words in it. All right, our, our federal tax code has millions. <laughs> right, so it is so difficult to actually comply with the tax code. And the penalties associated with not paying taxes are so significant that on average in this country, we spend between 35 and $40 billion a year just complying with the tax code. Just in compliance. That is 35 to $40 billion a year that was not spent the way you wanted. Arguably, it was not even spent the way politicians would spend it if they could just confiscate it from you. No, it was used because the government has created a tax system 
which is so onerous, so cumbersome, so difficult to figure out that it costs us tens of billions of dollars every year just to comply. What about the opportunities lost as a result of that? So let's recap here. Let's recap. First of all, whenever they say the rich aren't paying their fair share, you should ask yourself, first of all, what is a fair share? Make them define it. Make them define a fair share. Secondly, you need to go into what do you think the government should be spending money on? Like, what is the purpose of taxation? Third, cost-benefit analysis, right? This is not a question of whether or not something will be created in the economy. This is a question of who's going to do the creating. Is the creation going to come as a result of free people using the money they earned the way they wanted in order to buy the products and services that they wanted and created opportunities as a result of the actual demand of the people that earn the money? Or is it going to be created, or is there going to be something created based off of what the government or politicians thought should be created? So what, what is the cost-benefit analysis to the taxes that you are, are raising what opportunities are lost? And does the opportunities gained supersede the opportunities lost? That, that's a fair question. And what I'm willing to bet is most people are not going to be able to give you a straight answer to that because it, it never even factors in. And you can tell this by the way the government measures success and how they spend your tax dollars. They'll say, well, we spent this much on education. Can I be honest? I care far less how much you spend on education than I do the actual benefit to the student. If the, if the net benefit to the student is higher because the quality of the education is better, regardless of how much you spent on it, that, that is what I'm after. I'm after on a better quality education. Now, what the government is telling me is that in order to get that better quality education, they have to take my money and then they have to spend it on education. Or I can spend money on education. Right? Seen versus unseen. They have to justify what it is that they're spending your money on and why it's producing a better result. But again, what do they, what do they usually use? We're spending this much on this project. That doesn't tell me much. I want to see results. And what you're going to see, whether it's government welfare programs, of which there are numerous between federal and state, whether it's education spending, whether it's higher education spending, infrastructure spending, what you are going to see more often than not is the government is incredibly wasteful. They promise you one thing, or they, they promise you an incentive. We're going we're gonna to invest in our kids' education because education is the key to a good job. Okay, great. Is the education that you've invested in resulting in better jobs? That's the metric I want to see. I don't want to see political intentions. I don't want to see hyperbole. I, I don't want to see promises that are not measurable except for how much money you've spent. I want to see what is the net benefit based off of the money that you confiscated and spent on a particular endeavor. So those are the three things that you should be asking whenever taxes come up. Those, those are the, that lays the foundation for any future conversation. Right? Because what you're also going to find is the moment you start to actually ask them to define certain terms, the moment you start to ask them, now all of a sudden they get nervous. They want to revert to, again, hyperbole. They don't want to be, they want to be non-specific about what they mean because the moment they're specific, now there's a metric, now there's a measurement whereby you can determine whether or not the expenditure is actually achieving the results they've promised. And believe me, that is the last thing most people in elected office want. They want it to just be a foregone conclusion that if they're spending money on something that sounds good, it is better than it otherwise would have been. So those three questions, those are absolutely critical in this discussion. The other thing that I would just say when we're looking at taxes overall, and again, this goes down to kind of a philosophical level here. There, there's a general rule that you get more of what you reward and less of what you punish. And now there, there'll be some people on the left that will argue back, well, paying taxes is not punishment. Okay, Let, let's just say for argument's sake, it's not punishment. Let's, let's assume... I'm not conceding this argument for the sake of the debate. Let's just assume that, okay, yeah, we all agree that there's some taxes that are going to be paid. The method in which you collect taxes has an effect on productivity in the marketplace. So presumably, what you want is maximum productivity and maximum opportunity. Presumably, that's what you want. 
So this begs the question, if you've got to take taxes and you understand that there is a cost associated with taking taxes, how do you take taxes in such a way that you achieve a couple of things? One, you don't want to pervert or punish productive behavior. Well, what do you call it when the more money you earn by doing something productive, right? I'm not talking about, you know, making money through fraud or waste or abuse or just through the government handing you money. I mean, you went out, you started a business or you work really hard at a business and you're providing goods and services that other people want, right? They weren't forced to do business with you. It's not like the government where you're forced to do business with the government. You were not forced to do business with a company. You voluntarily did business with them. Why? Because they provided something that made your life better. And now you want to come in as the federal government and you want to tax that business and you want to increase the taxes on the business, the better a job they do at providing you the goods and services that you want. What sort of incentive structure have you created there? Or, or here's another question with all the welfare programs that we have. Why is it that when somebody is desperately trying to improve their own lot in life, and they're trying to move from a place of government dependency to in individual dependency, self-dependency, or self-sufficiency. Why is it that they are punished, not just with respect to the taxes they have to pay, but the benefits they're able to receive as they are making forward progression to no longer needing the government assistance? Why is that? What, what sort of incentive do you think that creates? Does that incentivize, first of all, that, in that first example, does that incentivize businesses to continue to invest and grow and provide the products and services that make all of our lives better? No, it hurts them for it. And on the other side of the spectrum, does it help the poor person that is diligently working harder to try to become um, you know, self-reliant? Uh, does, does it help them to punish them with additional taxes or to remove benefits in such a way that it is better for them to lose their job than it is to continue to move up? What sort of incentive structure have you created there? And yet that's exactly what our tax code is doing. And, and one of the most disingenuous arguments that you hear all the time is when you will hear politicians talk about corporate taxes or capital gains taxes. First of all, let's take capital gains. This is where the whole Warren Buffett pays less taxes than his secretary. The secretary is getting taxed on her income right? Warren Buffett is getting taxed both on his income, but also on capital gains. So what's the difference? If you get a paycheck, if you get money for doing something, maybe you're the head of the company, maybe you're the secretary in the company, you will get taxed on that income based off of how much you made. Again, if you're making under 80,000, when you take into account things like earned income tax credits and all the wealth transfers and everything else, you're paying almost nothing in federal income taxes but you get taxed on that income. Now let's say you take a portion of what you have left over after the government has taken their cut and you invest it in a company. So instead of going right out and you know, going out to dinner or you know, buying a new car or whatever, you take that money and you invest it in a company. And in a year or two years, you start to get dividends or you build up that stock over a certain amount of time and then you sell that stock. Now the government comes in and taxes you again. So don't feed me this garbage that somebody making kids, that somebody getting taxed at a lower rate for capital gains is somehow getting over on the system. Again, what do you want people with money to do? Because go investing it in other projects, which then end up providing additional opportunities and jobs is a good thing. And capital gains is a double tax on that. You've already taxed the income once. Now you're taxing it again. Are, are we really saying that we want to tax investment? at a higher rate than we already do? So capital gain, that's disingenuous when they talk about that. When they say that is a net benefit only to the rich, that is a lie. That is a flat out lie. And you can ask anybody that has tried to get ahead by maybe working harder and maybe buying a rental property or buying another house. And all of a sudden they own it for a couple of years and when they sell it, they've got to pay capital gains on it. Is that fair? They already paid taxes on the money that they used to buy the investment property. Should they have to pay more money on it again when they sell it? You're disincentivizing people to invest and actually accumulate wealth, which theoretically is what you want everybody to be able to do. So that's one of the biggest ones, capital gains. Let's look at corporate taxation. What is corporate taxes? 
First of all, this is another area where politicians deliberately manipulate people because they'll say things like, well, corporations aren't paying their fair share. Let me make something really clear here. Corporations don't pay taxes because corporations can't pay taxes. A corporation is in and of itself, it's just a, it's a, it's a legal arrangement among people. The only entity that can pay taxes are people. But politicians love to give you this impression that there's some evil corporation over here that's not paying its taxes. Let me tell you something. Everybody that works for that corporation, from the CEO, the board members, to the laborers, to the guy that sweeps the hallways, they are paying some form of taxes. Now, again, if, if you're not making much, then you're probably not paying any federal income taxes, but you are paying those taxes. Anybody that works for a corporation or owns the corporation, whatever it is, they are paying taxes on their income. They are paying taxes on their property. They are paying taxes when they engage in financial transactions. They are paying all of those taxes. And now the government wants to come in again and tax the corporation for doing what? Making a profit. So once again, a business is doing exactly what we want the business to do, which is create products and services that make all of our lives better. And now the government's going to come in and tax them on top of what they've already been taxed because they happen to be a business or happen to be a corporation. You are taxing productivity. So it's important to understand how manipulative the language has gotten in this and, and how much it is driven toward this idea of class warfare. And the reason why I hate that is because in the United States, we don't have classes in the sense that class structure has been understood throughout history. It used to be in certain times and places and cultures, you were born into a class, right? And, and sometimes if you go back to antiquity, that could be the, that could be the warrior class, that could be the priest class, that could be the government class. It could be what they, what they referred to as the peasant class, right? Those are the classes. We don't have classes in the United States in that respect. Yes, people might be born into different circumstances. There's no way to avoid that. The only way that you can avoid that is typically, whenever it's been tried, is to make everyone poorer and more miserable. So everyone is born with different advantages, different disadvantages. They're, they're born into families with different economic statuses. The question is, is have we created an environment where people are able to rise up and better themselves? And the question with respect to our government is, do we have a tax system which leaves them as free as possible to do those things? Or do we have a tax system which benefits destructive behavior while at the same time disincentivizing productive behavior? So when we talk about taxes, we need to talk about it not just from an economic standpoint. We also need to talk about it from a moral standpoint. And one of the biggest things that we have to do is define our terms. That's where things like fair share come in, right? On top of defining our terms, we also need to talk about what is the end result? What is the objective you want? Because if you can, if you can require someone, or if you can at least ask someone, when you're having a debate about who, who should pay what in taxes, if you can get them to agree on what a fair share is, or at least give you their definition, and you can get them to agree on what the end state is, well, now we have something measurable. But the whole reason Joe Biden uses the terms he does is because he doesn't want something measurable. He wants to be able to move the goalposts whenever he pleases because he's already made up in his mind that what society is missing is more government intervention into our lives. And Joseph Story said this in the, I think it was the 1700s, might have been the 1800s. Joseph Story said that the ability to tax is the ability to destroy. Because there is a certain level of taxation for which a business cannot survive, an individual cannot survive. And right now the government has a, an incredible amount of power and an incredible ability to use coercion and force to confiscate people's property. 
And we need to look at that from both a moral perspective and an economic perspective whenever we're debating the issue of taxes. Because if this is all about just facts and figures that we throw out, everyone is going to have the statistics to suit the conclusion that they want to come to. But the moment you make someone define their terms, express what they think legitimate functions of government are, and then provide you measurable criteria by, by which you can determine whether or not their pot tax policy has achieved the desired results, that's where we can actually have a productive conversation and hopefully get to a point where we can reform our tax system to where taxes, when they are collected, are collected as fairly and equitably as possible and only for the purpose of fulfilling legitimate functions of government because we as a society have finally understood and grasped, and specifically politicians have finally grasped, that just because the government spends money on something doesn't mean it has done a better job or produced something better than what would have been produced if you would have allowed the people that earned the money in the first place to keep more of what they created. All right. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. A couple of resources, if you want to do some more research on this. Tax Foundation does some excellent work on really digging into the numbers on who pays taxes, how much they pay, what the rates look like. They also provide recommendations on what would a better, what would a better more productive tax system look like, which actually encourages growth and encourages people to improve their own situation instead of making them dependent upon government programs that are subsidized by wealth redistribution. Uh, there's another economist named uh, uh, Anthony Davies. He does some really good work on this as well. I encourage you to look up. He's actually got a lot of videos on Learn Liberty. If you want to learn more about taxes, if you want to learn more about government debt, he's a great resource for that, Professor Anthony Davies. Um, Heritage Foundation has some great uh, charts. If you're a visual learner, I know, you know visualization helps for me a lot. If you want to look at you know, what, what is government spending actually going toward, um, what does taxation look like over time? Um, one of the most fascinating things that you'll find out, and, and Professor Davies talks about this, is the idea that regardless of what the different tax rates have been over time, government revenues always tend to be about 18% of the total economy. So the, 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 the total productive capacity, even when they're high, even when they're lower, it tends to be right around 18%. And that's because people modify their behavior. Again, if you're going to punish someone for creating more, well, then at a certain point, they just create less because there's no benefit in creating it. And then the government ends up taking in less as a result. And so, again, it's, it's talking about that seen versus the unseen. And instead of talking about just intentions, talking about incentive structures and how to actually affect things. So those are some resources I would highly encourage you to take a look at. Another website that does a great job talking about these issues is the Foundation for Economic Education. And then, as I said before, that book, Economics in One Lesson. Um, it, it's an older book, uh, written again, written by uh, uh, Hazlitt, but he does a great job with examples that I think are really easy to understand. And when you find yourselves in these conversations with people, a lot of times it's important for someone to understand that, look, it, keep, wanting to keep more of what you earn does not make you greedy. Wanting more of what somebody else has earned, uh, that, that's a pretty good definition for greed. And that was actually a great quote by Thomas Sowell where he actually, he says that. He goes, I've never understood why it's greedy to want to keep more of what you've earned, but not greedy to want to take more of what somebody else has earned. All right, so those are some resources. Professor Anthony Davies, uh, Foundation for Economic Education, Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt, uh, and the Tax Foundation. I highly encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, they'll give you some really good resources. Once again, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to try to get Tina on next episode. Again, we, we've got some, some great things that we're going to talk about on there on, on what it was like. She also ran for office, what it was like for her running as a conservative woman. Um, you're going to see a lot of parallels on what it's like for a conservative woman running. And uh, based off of the, the controversy that we've seen on how Senator Tim Scott was treated, uh, when he gave the rebuttal to Joe Biden's State of the Union address. I mean, some of just the absolute racist remarks made against Tim Scott because Senator Scott refuses to engage in the sort of group think that certain people on the left demand that he engage in based on the color of his skin. You're going to find that some of that group think is also required of women as well. And Tina's going to be able to share some of her personal experiences from that and how she combated it. So once again, thank you for joining us on Making the Argument. We'll see you next time. And uh, take care out there.